garer après les fleurs. Là. The first time I saw the audio discs, it was in the cellar. They had been left in storage unheard for many decades. Listening to them gave me the chills. Will you state your full name? Wilhelm Keitel. Julius Streicher. Karl Dönitz. At the end of World War II, top Nazi leaders were put on trial. For 10 months, this trial revealed unknown details about major battles. U boats were to shoot up the lifeboats. And wartime crimes. How did you tolerate all these men being murdered? Hello, everybody. Unknown to many, the entire proceeding was recorded on more than 2,000 audio discs. While we were digitizing the discs, we preferred to keep it a secret. We had fears that someone would steal and destroy the discs because they contain really important testimonies about the war. Most of this audio has never been heard until now. Tell us about preparations for gas warfare. Dieser Vorschlag ging von Dr. Goebbels aus. This is the story of World War II. Das war ein Befehl, der mir von Hitler gegeben ist. Hitler, Sieg! and the most chilling criminals in history. As you've never heard it before. This is the BBC Home Service. The end of the war in Europe was officially announced at three o'clock this afternoon. The commanders of the German forces have come to this headquarters today to make unconditional surrender. At the end of the war, the question of course emerged is what to do with the defeated Nazi leadership. We have to remember that at the time, the public was just absorbing the stories that were coming out of the liberated Western camps. And so public opinion polls aggressively supported the idea of summary execution. But then mainly coming from the Americans, there was the proposal to actually have a legal response. If the truth of Nazi rule was not established in a due process of law, then it was very likely that someday people would even deny that the atrocities that the Nazi regime had committed took place. There was the idea that a big case could be presented publicly to help explain, to help make sense of what had just happened to the world. But by the time a trial is a possibility at all in the fall of 1945, it's really a question of who they can still catch. This is London calling. Hitler is dead. The SS chief Heinrich Himmler also ends his life. With several top Nazis dead, the Allies decide to hold a group trial of the remaining German leaders. Among the more prominent Nazis seized are Admiral Dönitz and Albert Speer, Minister of Economics and Production. 
they arrest and charge just over 20 major officials who represent the full scope of the Nazi system. Keitel was chief of the German armed forces. Streicher was known for his anti-Semitic propaganda. Rudolf Hess had been Hitler's stenographer as Hitler was dictating Mein Kampf. Goering was the number two figure in the Nazi party. During the war, he was the head of the Luftwaffe, the head of the four-year plan. He is the biggest Nazi war criminal still alive. The trial will be held in Nuremberg, Germany. As the former site of Hitler's infamous party rallies, it is considered to be the symbolic birthplace of Nazism. So Nuremberg is seen as the perfect spot in which to punish the Nazis. In the city's Palace of Justice, the Nazis will face an international tribunal made up of judges and prosecutors from four allied nations. It was Britain, America, Russia, and the French. And so they all had their own prosecuting councils. Although they will work together, the American and British prosecutors will take the lead. We have an opportunity to bring to a just judgment those who have thought it safe to wage aggressive and ruthless war. Robert H. Jackson is the American chief prosecutor. He had been attorney general and in 1941, US Supreme Court justice. He really is America's leading lawyer. It is the only hope for Germany and the world that our people realize and repent for what has happened. David Maxwell Fife was the leading prosecutor for the British. He'd suffered from the bombing in London and he hated the Nazis. To prepare their case, Allied investigators scour the countryside, gathering witnesses and evidence. The unconditional surrender gave the Allies access to all German records. That was unprecedented. And that really strengthens the knowledge level as they're heading for trial in Nuremberg. This is Arthur Gates in Nuremberg, Germany. If the 43 pages of charges prepared by the four capable prosecutors are made to stick, this trial will not only make history, but also establish precedent in international criminal law. The atmosphere at the start of the trial was incredibly electric. Hello, recording, hello, recording. You have to bear in mind, this is the first international criminal trial in human history. That's one, two, three, four. And we have heads of state being accused of an extraordinary range of horrific crimes. Attention. The International Military Tribunal will now enter. They knew that with this trial, they would be revealing information that no one had known before. That's why the decision was made to capture the full proceedings in an audio recording. Some of these recordings will be played for the first time in this film. The present defendants stand charged here today with crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and of a common plan or conspiracy to commit those crimes I will now call upon the defendants 
to plead guilty or not guilty to the charges against them. Ich bekenne mich nicht schuldig. Nicht schuldig. Nicht schuldig. When you listen to the defendants, Nein. they speak with a kind of bizarre confidence. Ich bekenne mich nicht schuldig. And they all plead not guilty. Nicht schuldig. None of them consider themselves to be guilty. Ich bekenne mich im Sinne der Anklage nicht schuldig. To establish the Nazis' guilt, prosecutors intend to lay out a wide range of crimes, to reveal exactly how the Nazis were able to wage such a devastating war. And they will seek to prove that starting the war was the Nazis' plan from the beginning. Here, the defendant Goering in the witness box now. As Hitler's former right hand man, defendant Hermann Goering was a high ranking member of the Nazi government and German military. One of the many accusations against him is that he took a lead role in conspiring to wage war almost immediately after the Nazis came to power. Now, as early as 1933, after you came to power, you regarded it as necessary to rearm Germany, regardless of any treaty limitations, did you not? Diskutiert worden ist sie selbstverständlich gleich im Jahre 33, weil sofort feststand, dass ja irgendetwas unter unserer Regierung anders geschehen müsste. At the end of the First World War, the Versailles Treaty had forced a large number of restrictions on the German military. Das deutsche Volk ist glücklich, dass Hitler die Auffassung vertrat, dass Deutschland von dem Diktat von Versailles freikommen müsste. Und auf ihre Schulden tragen. Adolf Hitler and the clique of professional military leaders that followed him into office, like Hermann Goering, who was an accomplished fighter pilot during the First World War, said, if we don't rearm, we're just going to be victimized by other world powers. Nun war das nicht Adolf Hitler allein, sondern jeder patriotische Deutsche fühlte das ebenso. But what emerges during the tribunal is that German rearmament had a greater goal than simply protecting Germany. That they were secretly preparing to take on the world. Remember, captured documents are just incredibly powerful, authentic smoking guns. If you've got the right documents, you've pretty much got magic evidence. May it please the tribunal. One of the most striking and revealing captured documents is a document which we have come to know as the Hosbach Note of a conference on 5 November 1937. Friedrich Hosbach had been part of Hitler's personal staff. And that memo was prepared in the wake of a meeting between Hitler and a small number of members of the military. I note the defendant Hermann Wilhelm Goering was present. In this conspiratorial meeting, Adolf Hitler posed a question. The question for Germany is where the greatest possible conquest could be made at the lowest cost. It was very clear from that memo that Hitler wanted land, and that land would come from Austria, Czechoslovakia, possibly Poland. It's a stunning revelation. Only according to Goering, there's a simple explanation. Hosbach war bei der Sitzung zugegen und machte sich darüber Notizen. Fünf Tage später hat er dann 
die Niederschrift gemacht. Es ist also eine Niederschrift, die Fehler enthält. But the prosecution is about to reveal Gehring's lie. When Nazi Germany starts taking over countries like Austria and Czechoslovakia, at the time, the interpretation is that the people in those countries wanted it. Yet what captured documents reveal is that the Nazis were secretly putting pressure on their governments to hand over their countries to Nazi Germany. I now offer in evidence the actual events in Austria. There's actually a telephone conversation that's introduced into the trial of how Goering bullies uh, Schuschnigg, the, the Austrian chancellor. I turn now to copies of the telephone conversation. Top secret. Goering, you go and tell the federal president that if the conditions are not accepted immediately, the troops who are already stationed at the frontier will march in tonight and Austria will cease to exist. The Nazis were actually able to secure Austria by making a threat of force. Goering refuses to admit any wrongdoing. Ein Angriffskrieg führt man, wenn man schießt, Bomben wirft und so weiter. Hier wurde aber nur eins geworfen und das waren Blumen. But the evidence continues to mount. I should like now to offer in evidence the conquest of Czechoslovakia. In the second week of March, 1939, in response to the summons from Hitler, Monsieur Hasha, the president of the Czechoslovak Republic, arrived in Berlin. Hasha was ushered into the Reich Chancellor. He found there Adolf Hitler, Goering, and other high Nazi officials. They have him in a lamplit room. It's like a scene straight out of The Godfather, Godfather II. This is the captured German account of this infamous meeting. They reminded him that in three hours, the German army would cross the border. The defendant Goering boasted of what his Luftwaffe would do if the Czech forces dared to resist. Goering bullies him and says to him, if you don't give up and allow our troops to march in, we will bomb Prague to the ground. He couldn't hardly deny it. So he tried to minimize and tried to lie. I said to him, it can only be about unnötiges blood vergießen handeln. I have dabei auch die Äußerung getan, dass es mir leid täte, wenn ich das schöne Prag bombardieren müsste. But it's pretty clear that this is criminal behavior. Under this threat, the aged president of Czechoslovakia signed the document with which the Nazi conspirators confronted him. What we basically have is Germany holding a gun up to the head of the leaders of Austria and Czechoslovakia. And it's all part of this aggressive policy which is inevitably going to lead to the Second World War. We'll go on with the evidence tomorrow. Yes. This is Arthur Gates in Nuremberg, Germany. In the Nuremberg Palace of Justice, I can the, court. the prosecution is well into its case. At Nuremberg, the prosecution demonstrates that the annexation of Austria 
the seizure of Czechoslovakia is all part of this aggressive policy of the Nazi regime. But none of that had really led to direct military conflict. It really isn't until Germany's attack on Poland that we have the beginning of the Second World War. So it was important to prosecutors to look at what happened during the invasion of Poland. Colonel Ehrman will represent the United States this morning. May it please the tribunal, I propose to call as witness for the prosecution, Major General Erwin Lehausen. Erwin von Lauhausen had been a high-ranking member of the Nazis' military espionage group called the Abwehr. You stand in front of the microphone there so that you can be heard. He has detailed knowledge of top-secret events leading up to the invasion of Poland. The defendants were not aware that he was going to be testifying against them. Was the Abwehr ever asked to furnish any assistance for the Polish campaign? Yeah. Will you explain to the tribunal the nature of the assistance required? The Angelegenheit, für die ich jetzt Zeugenschaft ablege, ist eine der mysteriösesten Aktionen, die sich abspielte. Back in 1939, Nazi leadership had claimed that the fighting only began after Polish troops first attacked German soldiers. According to them, Poland is to blame for the start of the war. That's the way that the story was presented to the world. It was Germany simply defending its border. But General von Lauhausen is about to stun the world with the truth. Will you please explain exactly what took place? Erhielt meine Abteilung, die Abwehrabteilung 2, den Auftrag, polnische Uniformen bereitzustellen. And what was the purpose? dass mit diesen Uniformen Leute aus Konzentrationslagern verkleidet wurden, die dann irgendeine militärische Angriffshandlung gegen den Sender Gleiwitz durchführen sollten. And so what actually happened was that the Germans dressed some prisoners up in Polish uniform and used that as the pretext for invading the western half of Poland. What happened to the men that wore the Polish uniforms and created this incident? Sollen auch alle Leute, die daran beteiligt gewesen sind, umgelegt, also getötet worden sein? Is there any slightest doubt in your mind about that? Nein. This is a bowl him over moment. Goering calls von Lauhausen Schwein, meaning pig. He says, Verrat, treason, Verräter, uh, traitor. Goering even says he should have been gassed. Von Lauhausen's testimony leaves the courtroom and the world reeling. Okay, recording that call for now. Return till tomorrow at 9.30. But it won't stop the Nazis from still attempting to lie their way out of responsibility for the war. Criminals can always find a way to deny. What is your name? Er hat mich. 
Erhard Milch is a witness for the defense. During the war, he served directly under Goering in the Luftwaffe. Für die hier angeklagten Herren, die ganze Frage des Krieges als eine große Überraschung gekommen ist. You want this tribunal to understand you as an officer, as saying that there was no preparation. How long did it take to overrun Denmark? Denmark, ganz kurz. How long did it take to overrun Holland and Belgium? Wenige Tage. How long did it take to take possession of Norway? Auch eine kurze Zeit. And how long did it take to overrun France and take Paris? Wohl im Ganzen zwei Monate. And those were all surprise movements. You were surprised at every one of them. Is that your testimony? Yeah. But it is not just the conquest of nations that prosecutors will show was pre-planned. They will soon reveal how propaganda was used to not only gain public support for the war, but also to help pave the way for one of the largest mass murders of the 20th century. I think one of the big problems with history is that we look at the past through the eyes of the present. This is especially true of Nazism. We would tend to see Nazism through the prism of the brutality when it's anti-Semitism. But what you've got to remember is that's not how the German people saw Hitler at all. The appeal of Nazism was not negative, it was utopian. I'm going to build a new Germany, and I'm going to make Germany a great power. It was a utopian appeal. And so it was very important for the Nuremberg process to lay out how they eventually induced people to think that the evil that they were being asked to participate in was virtue of some kind. Now let us consider for a moment the doctrinal techniques of the Nazi conspirators. The first was the master race doctrine, calling anything non-German, and you have a clear right, indeed a duty, to cast it out. Propaganda played a large role in the prosecution's argument. Meine deutsche Jugend. Because indoctrination was perceived as a driving force of bringing along the German population in the aggressive Nazi policies. Will you repeat this oath after me? I think a clear indicator for this is the charges against Julius Streicher. Julius Streicher had been an elementary school teacher before aspiring to politics. In the early 1920s, he founded Der Stürmer, a viciously racist newspaper. It would eventually become a significant part of Nazi propaganda and continue publication until the end of the war. We have uh, an example of the really remarkable lengths to which he went. I quote, one single cohabitation of a Jew with an Aryan woman is sufficient to poison her blood forever. The Aryan is impregnated with an alien species. How 
had, you know, wild allegations against Jews. It equated them with parasites and leeches and rats. I have not attempted to have translated all of the articles. It is perhaps sufficient to look at the pictures. All of this is very much unearthed at Nuremberg. His newspapers are crowded with them. Week after week, day after day, it is impossible to pick up any copy without finding the same kind of stuff. That is very important material, because what the trial revealed was the building up and the creation of an enemy image. Nach der Machtübernahme wurde die Tagespresse gleichgeschaltet und es war die Anordnung ergangen vom Führer, dass jede Zeitung aufklärende Artikel über die Judenfrage zu bringen hätte. Already before Hitler comes to power, there is certainly anti-Semitism and this sort of vague sense amongst many that there's a Jewish problem that has to be solved somehow. And, you know, hopefully this government will get that done. Nicht aufhetzen und nicht aufreizen wollte ich, sondern aufklären. Ich selbst habe nie geschrieben, brennt die Häuser der Juden nieder, schlagt sie tot. But you know, do you not, that starting with the boycott, which you led yourself in 1933, the Jews thereafter were deprived of the right to vote. They were forced to wear a yellow star, and they had their houses and their business taken away from them. Do you call that enlightenment? So the trial was important for connecting dots that had not previously been connected. I'm suggesting that you set out to incite the German people to murder and to accept the murder of the Jewish race. Das ist nicht wahr. I've no doubt you'll say it isn't true. I just want to make myself quite clear to what I'm suggesting. In many ways, Nuremberg was more than the prosecution of the defendants. It was also making Germans confront what they had acquiesced to. But there wasn't much appetite for this in Germany at that time. To capture the attention of the German public, Prosecutors turned to a type of evidence that had rarely been used in courtrooms before. They actually interrupt their case to suddenly show a film in the courtroom. Prosecution will at this time present a documentary film on concentration camps. This is by no means the entire proof which the prosecution will offer, but this film represents what the words concentration camp imply. At this concentration camp, the Germans starved, clubbed, and burned to death more than 4,000 prisoners over a period of eight months. On a table is a lampshade made of human skin, made at the request of an SS officer's wife. At the time, the world really hadn't seen footage like this. This really had an incredibly galvanizing effect
Fife himself say he was fighting back the tears. After that, I wasn't so much a prosecutor, he said, as a terrier dog. You know, I wanted these men to be convicted. I call on General Rudenko for the Soviet Union. Я к изложению преступлений, совершенных гитлеровскими агрессорами против моей страны. Тысяча девятьсот сорок первого года гитлеровская Германия переломно напала на СССР. What the Nuremberg trial did was pay quite a bit of attention to the kind of German warfare that was waged in the East. Невиданный террор, грабежи, насилие и убийства военнопленных и мирных граждан. The estimate for casualties in the Soviet Union was 26 million. More than half of that is estimated to be civilians. And because of the Nuremberg trial, we know now that there wouldn't be a Holocaust without the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Then you will call the defendant Keitel. Wilhelm Keitel had been the chief of the high command of the German armed forces. You would repeat this oath after me. A devout supporter of Hitler, he participated in the planning of all ground combat operations during the war. You must sit down if you wish. But it is the planning for the invasion of the Soviet Union that prosecutors want to get to the bottom of. <laughs> Я обращаюсь к документу распоряжение о применении военной подсудности в районе Барбароса и об особых мероприятиях войск. Вы помните этот документ? Das war ein Befehl, der mir von Hitler gegeben ist. It's discovered that just a few months before the invasion of the Soviet Union. Hitler called together various senior figures and described how the war in the East was to be conducted. This meeting was translated into a top secret order called the Barbarossa Decree, which Keitel signed and issued to the German military. This is the document Prosecutor Rudenko is presenting to the court. The Barbarossa Decree was the first time that it was explicitly stated that this was a war of annihilation. It was either Nazism or Bolshevism. The world was not big enough for both. Таким образом, заранее планировалось вами убийство людей. Ich habe nur die mir vom Führer erteilten Aufträge weitergegeben. For Keitel to pass on an order that he knew was illegal made him complicit. He knew full well that it was going to result in the deaths of many, many people. And the Barbarossa Decree is just one murderous directive that the prosecution has uncovered. This order was by no means the end, was it? Prosecutors reveal a series of secret orders that condone the killing of POWs and civilians as well as the ruthless pillaging of food and vital resources. These orders fed into this whole narrative that this is a conflict between two different cultures, two different races, and only one can survive. And by August 1941, the evidence showed the start of mass executions of women and children. 
That is unprecedented. I wish to call as a witness for the prosecution, Mr. Otto Ohlendorf. Otto Ohlendorf has first-hand knowledge of these early mass murders. A former officer with the Nazi Schutzstaffel, or SS, he had commanded an Einsatzgruppen unit on the Eastern Front. Einsatzgruppen were these mobile extermination units who basically comb through towns in conquered Eastern Europe and engaged in mass executions. Es war die Weisung geteilt, dass in dem Arbeitsraum der Einsatzgruppen im russischen Territorium die Juden zu liquidieren seien. Ebenso die politischen Kommissare der Sowjets. And when you say liquidated, do you mean kill? Damit meine ich töten. Now, will you explain to the tribunal in detail how a mass execution was carried out? Die Zusammenfassung erfolgte unter dem Vorwand der Umsiedlung. Nach der Registrierung wurden die Juden an einem Ort zusammengefasst. Von da aus wurden sie dann später zu dem Hinrichtungsort, Hinrichtungsort gefahren. Die Hinrichtungen wurden militärisch durchgeführt durch Peter Tonks mit entsprechenden Kommandos. Being able to hear this kind of banality of evil in the audio recordings is shocking. What was notable was the straightforwardness and sobriety of his, uh, his recounting of things. Now will you continue? Sie wurden mit LKWs an die Hinrichtungsplatz gefahren, und zwar immer so viel, wie unmittelbar hingerichtet werden konnten. Diese Weise wurde versucht, die Zeitspanne so kurz wie möglich zu halten, in der die Opfer von dem, was ihnen bevorstand, Kenntnis bekamen, bis zu dem Zeitpunkt der tatsächlichen Hinrichtung. His testimony was absolutely devastating. This was a true manifestation of Nazi racial policy and their plans for domination. And in a lot of ways, Ollendorf's testimony is a preview of what's going to be revealed later in the trial. Hello, sorry, Cody. Hello, sorry, Cody. What I want to understand is this. How did you tolerate all these young men being murdered one after the other without making any protest? I want to understand what's in your mind. During the trial, people had intense interest in the psychology of the defendants. The Americans even retained the psychologist, GM Gilbert, to perform extensive psychological testing on the Nazis. Things like Rorschach exams, uh, intelligence tests because there was this general question, are they just a bunch of psychopaths who happen to hijack a regime? There were a couple of defendants who were not necessarily in the best psychological health. One of them was Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess was a close confidant of Hitler during the early days of the Nazi party. He is accused of conspiring with Hitler to wage war and committing crimes against peace. But during the trial, Hess puts forth a surprising defense. He claims he doesn't remember any of it. He says, I have amnesia. 
So they have a serious question about whether he's mentally competent. This is Leslie Nichols speaking from Nuremberg, Germany. For a long time now, the International Military Tribunal of Nuremberg has been trying to get an answer to the question, is there a crazy man in the house? I call upon counsel for the defendant, Hess. Dass der angeklagte Hess behandlungsunfähig ist. Of course, some think he's faking, and others think he's mad as a hatter. But then Hess asks to testify. Herr Präsident, ab nun mehr steht mein Gedächtnis auch nach außen hin wieder zur Verfügung. Die Gründe für das Vortäuschen von Gedächtnisverlust sind taktischer Art. He finally says, oh, everything I was saying was untrue. I remember it all. That was part of my strategy. There's just a kind of stunned silence. The tribunal at that point really has no choice but to take his word for it and certify him as competent. But then, and I think ever since, it's a serious question whether that was accurate or whether that was just another piece of his craziness. Unter den damaligen Umständen war ich hatte das für möglich, zumal der Jurist als Offiziere an der Front gestanden haben. In the case of the other defendants, the psychological testing demonstrated that these are terrifyingly normal people, high IQ individuals. And that raises very troubling questions about the capacity of all people to engage in acts under similar circumstances. May I please, the tribunal? With the march of Nazi armies over Europe, wholesale murders were disguised under the name of anti-partisan actions. But not every undesirable could be liquidated. When the Germans had invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, the Germans gambled by mobilizing far more troops than they could actually sustain for any length of time. Because the intention was that the war would be over by the end of 1941. So when the war didn't end, there was an enormous problem. The problem was how to produce enough weapons and supplies to keep the German war machine going. And the Nazis' solution would be revealed as a brutal one. The evidence relating to the Nazi slave labor program shall show that it was a policy which compelled foreign civilians and prisoners of war to manufacture armaments and to engage in other operations where they were literally worked to death in the course of the Nazi program of extermination through work. Foreign laborers became the serfs of the master race and they were enslaved by the millions. This document is a top secret memorandum from the files of the defendant Rosenberg, dated the 21st day of December, 1942. They are now catching humans like the dog catchers used to catch dogs. According to the prosecution, one of the masterminds behind this immense slave labor program was defendant Albert Speer. A trained architect who had risen to prominence by designing monumental buildings for Hitler, he is far from what many consider to be a stereotypical Nazi. Albert Speer came from a very high-ranking upper-class background. Hitler loved architecture, so he became very close to Hitler. 
during the war, Hitler tended to trust him, thought he could do anything. He made him the Minister of Armaments. Will you repeat this oath after me? So Speer absolutely had to know that the workers that he was demanding to ramp up German military production were not volunteers. This was perhaps the most horrible slaving operation in history. Who is responsible for these conditions? Hierfür war weder ich noch das Ministerium verantwortlich. Es gab Bestrebungen in Deutschland, durch schärfere Zwangsmaßnahmen eine höhere Leistung zu erzielen. Diese Bestrebungen fanden nicht meine Billigung. He's very intelligent. Es ist ausgeschlossen, 14 Millionen Arbeiter durch Zwang und Terror zu einer befriedigenden Leistung zu bringen. And he's a very careful manipulator. Ich stand auch grundsätzlich auf dem Standpunkt, dass eine befriedigende Arbeitsleistung dauer nur durch den guten Willen des Arbeiters erzielt werden kann. I am not attempting to say that you were personally responsible. I merely give you what the regime was doing. And he fools them to a certain degree. Even Maxwell Feist says he was taken in by him. He said, at certain points, I thought, how can a man so cultured and so handsome be a monster? And Spear will not be the only defendant to try to blur the line between good and evil. For the most part, history has abided by the idea of the good German and the bad German. The evil, sickening villain and the reluctant Nazi. Because what we don't want is to look at what happened to Germany and say that could happen to anybody. And so this idea first takes shape during the Nuremberg trial. And we have cast Karl Dernitz as the reluctant naval professional that got caught up in things. But the reality is Karl Dernitz unpacks this larger story about the way that we are still attempting to reconcile what the Third Reich was. Adolf Hitler had immer in Mia nur den ersten Soldaten der Kriegsmarine gesehen. Karl Dernitz was a highly regarded naval officer. When Hitler first came into power, Dernitz oversaw the secret rebuilding of the U-boat, or submarine, fleet. He then commanded it with devastating effect during the first three years of the war. The defendant rose steadily in rank until he became commander-in-chief of the German Navy. Members of the tribunal will see it was not, however, only his ability as a naval officer, which won the defendant these high honors, these he owed to his capacity for utter ruthlessness. One of the accusations against Dernitz is that in the autumn of 1942, he directed his U-boats to start gunning down shipwrecked Allied sailors, murdering them in their lifeboats. In 1942, the Allies' determination to strengthen their transatlantic convoy system was beginning to result in a steadier flow of weapons and soldiers to Europe. And the defendant According to prosecutors, Dernitz's murderous directive was intended to stop these convoys. The trial audio reveals his vehement denial. The Bekämpfung dieser Menschen ist 
eine Frage der soldatischen Kampfsittlichkeit. Es ist nie in dieser Beziehung ein Befehl gegeben, sei er auch irgendwelcher Art. Well, the only problem for Dernitz is that there were a few U-boat messages that suggest that Dernitz did indeed provide some instructions to machine gun survivors in the water. Lord, this is a top secret order sent from the defendant's headquarters to all commanding officers of U-boats, dated September 1942. Rescue runs counter to the rudimentary demands of warfare for the destruction of enemy ships and crews. Be harsh. Now, Lord, that is a very carefully worded order, but its intentions are made very clear by the next document. Prosecutors reveal a copy of a secret conversation that took place between Hitler and the Japanese ambassador in early 1942. Führer pointed out that however many ships the United States built, one of their main problems would be the lack of personnel. For that reason, U-boats were to surface and shoot up the lifeboats. And on that, I shall call a witness So what is your name? Ich heiße Peter Josef Heisig. Peter Heisig is a former German submariner. He served under Admiral Dernitz during the war. Will you take your mind back to the autumn of 1942? Jawohl. Ich war Oberfehnrich zur See bei der 2. Unterseebootsleerdivision. Großadmiral Dönitz führte in seiner Rede aus: Besatzungen sind für die Schiffe genauso ein äh, sind für die Unterseeboote genauso ein Ziel wie auch die Schiffe. Einmal wird es nämlich dadurch den Alliierten unmöglich, ihre Schiffe ihre Neubauten mit Besatzungen auszurüsten. It is compelling evidence, but without a clearly written order, Dernitz can still deny it. He uses a very common defense. And that defense is there may have been outliers that chose to machine gun people in the water. But I never gave that order. Was er sonst behauptet hat, ist so unklar, dass ich der Glaubwürdigkeit von Heisig gar keinen Wert beimesse. And so Dernitz ended up being in this position of still possessing a little bit of a moral high ground. But I believe that is partly because what we want to see is the good German. And prosecutors will soon show that as the war dragged into 1943 and then 44, and victory began to slip from the Nazis' grasp, they were preparing to use any means necessary to avoid defeat. It may well be said that Hitler started the war without cause and prolonged it without reason. If he could not rule, he cared not what happened to Germany. As prosecutors turn their attention to the later stages of the war, they raise the question, of just how far German leadership was preparing to go to avoid defeat. Defendant Goering 
Hitler's former number two in command, is called back to the stand. At what time did you know that the war, so far as achieving the objectives that you had in mind, was a lost war? Das ist außerordentlich schwer zu sagen. Jedenfalls nach meiner Überzeugung verhältnismäßig spät. Zu diesem Zeitpunkt konnte ich nicht mehr anders denken, als dass langsam sich wahrscheinlich eine Niederlage entwickeln würde. Dass Hitler nicht verhandeln wollte, unter keinen Umständen, das war mir auch bekannt. And after that time, the air attacks which were continued against England were designed solely to effect a prolongation of what you then knew was a hopeless conflict. Ich kann nur bedauern, dass wir nicht genügend unbemannte, also V1 oder V2 Bomben hatten. Denn nur so konnte unter Umständen eine Rücksichtnahme auf den Einsatz gegen deutsche Städte erfolgen, wenn man dem Gegner genauso schwere Verluste beizubringen vermag. Hätte ich unter allen Umständen weitergefochten. Gehring realizes he's going to be executed. He knows this. You know, he, he says to people around him, you know, we're going to be killed, he says. He said, but what's the point of this trial? It's to give some kind of legacy. And he's trying to rally the other Nazis to say, at least have a kind of last stand. Stay true to Nazism. But of course, a lot of them don't want to do that. Albert Speer is one defendant who has shown he would rather cooperate with the prosecution and try to save his life. He's more than willing to spill details about the Nazis' secret plans for the end of the war. I want to ask you about the proposal to resort to poison gas warfare. Who made those proposals? Dieser Vorschlag ging von Dr. Goebbels aus. Joseph Goebbels had been the Nazi party's head of propaganda. A trusted member of the inner circle, he held considerable sway with Adolf Hitler right up to the end. Dass diese die Frage des Einsatzes unserer beiden neuen Kampfgase Tabun und Zarin, dass diese Gase, diese beiden, äh, von einer ganz außerordentlichen Wirkung waren, dass keine Gasmaske, also kein Gasschutz dagegen irgendwie vorhanden war nach unserer Kenntnis. At Nuremberg, we are hearing for the first time that Germany was beginning to consider the possibility of using poison gases on the battlefield as they had during the First World War. Now, will you tell us about preparations that were made for gas warfare? Uh, wir hatten für diese Gasfabrikation etwa drei Fabriken, die alle unzerstört waren und die bis November 1944 in vollem Betrieb waren. 
And so we know now it's just virtue of good fortune that the war ended when it did, because if it had stretched into 46 and God forbid 47, which could have happened, you could bet there would have been poison gas. It is a chilling confession, but it will pale next to the revelation of just how great the suffering in Europe had already been. to offer additional evidence at this time concerning the use of the Nazi concentration camps against the people of Germany and allied nationals. We wish to invite the tribunal's attention to a chart showing the Nazi system of concentration camps as they have become known since 1945. The trial is the first massive exposure of the intricacies and machinery of destruction. I should like to direct our attention to the treatment in these camps. The estimate at the time was 5.3 million Jewish victims, actually quite close to what we know now as the overall victim figure. At this point, my colleagues will present full evidence Will you repeat this oath after me? Witness Samuel Rajman is a Jewish man who had lived in Poland. I hereby swear that I will speak nothing but the truth. He and his family were confined to the Warsaw Ghetto before being taken to the extermination camp at Treblinka. I ask you to что представлял собой этот лагерь? В моем обличении прочетные люди застало забьяных от 10 до 12 тысяч со день. Со день приходили транспорты. Все мучили на тех местах, разобрать себя до нога. Oczywiście, że to rozbieranie się odbyło się pod nachajkami Niemców, którzy pilnowali ludzi. Natomiast nadzy ludzie wszyscy musieli przejść uliczką do komory gazowej. Moja praca była tylko ładować ubrania po, po, po tych zabitych ludzi na wagon. Będąc w obozie, przez dwa dni przywieźli mnie moją matkę, siostrę i dwóch braci. Musiałem patrzeć się, jak ich prowadzili do gazowni. Po kilku dniach koledzy moi znaleźli dokumenty mojej żony i dziecka. Wszystko, co mi zostało z mojej całej rodziny. Tylko fotografie. A lot of the things that we now take for granted, that we know about the Holocaust, this is information that was really being supplied for the first time. As witnesses step forward, they speak about the killings, beatings, and sadistic treatment that they had suffered at the hands of the Nazis. They reveal the truth about unimaginable horrors. Mogę powiedzieć o dzieciach, które do obozu koncentracyjnego zostały przywiezione. Kiedy były największe gazowania Żydów, wyszło zarządzenie, że dzieci będą wrzucane do pieców krematoryjnych albo do dołów krematoryjnych bez gazowania. Jak to powiedzieć, żywymi? 
Или их убивали другим способом? Дети бывали зусаны живы. Крик тех детей было слышать в целом о Боже. When concentration camp victims gave testimony, the defendants often looked away or took off their headphones. They wouldn't even react to evidence unless it was directed uh, at them personally. And then what else could they do but lie and deny? In erster Linie erwähne ich, ich habe den Umfang und die Art, wie es in den Konzentrationslagern zuging, nicht gewollt. But witness, you've seen the films since this trial started. You know that there were millions of garments, millions of shoes, 20 1,952 kilograms of gold wedding rings. All that which these people who were exterminated left behind them. Did nobody ever tell you all these came from the effects of these people who were murdered? Nein, und wie stellen Sie sich bitte das vor? Ich habe die großen Richtlinien für die deutsche Wirtschaft gegeben. Dazu gehörte nicht die Verwendung alter Schuhe und Kleider. So I'm asking about the murder of five million people. The Führer must have had full knowledge, mustn't he? dass es meine Meinung ist, dass der Führer über Einzelheiten in den Konzentrationslagern nicht unterrichtet gewesen ist. What the Nazis don't know is that their lies will be exposed by one of their own witnesses. Blood, I have an application on behalf of the defendant Kaltenbrunner for a witness called Hess. Rudolf Hess was the former commandant at Auschwitz. And strangely enough, Hess is called as a witness not by the prosecution, but by the defense. He's actually called by Kaltenbrunner's lawyer. Defendant Ernst Kaltenbrunner had been a high-ranking member of the SS. Earlier in the trial, evidence was presented showing he was heavily involved in the Nazi concentration camp system. But he and his lawyer hoped that by calling Hearst to the stand, they can distance him from the murders at Auschwitz. Ist es richtig, dass Sie 1941 nach Berlin zu Himmler bestellt wurden? Jawohl. Im Sommer 1941 wurde ich persönlichen Befehlsempfang zum Reichsführer SS Himmler nach Berlin befohlen. Dieser sagte mir, der Führer hat die Endlösung der Judenfrage befohlen. Haben Sie jemals bezüglich dieser Aufgabe mit Kaltenbrunner gesprochen? Nein, nie. So that little nugget is helpful for Kaltenbrunner. But of course that opens the door on cross-examination. And on cross-examination, the prosecution introduces an affidavit that Hirsch signed if you will follow along with me as I read, please. Yeah. 
I was ordered to establish extermination facilities at Auschwitz in June of 41. At that time, there were already three other extermination camps. I visited Treblinka to find out how they carried out their extermination. The camp commandant told me that he used monoxide gas, and I did not think that his methods were very efficient. So when I set up the extermination building at Auschwitz, I used Cyclone B, which we dropped into the death chamber from a small opening. Another improvement was that we built our gas chambers to accommodate 2,000 people at one time. It's one thing to kind of know the planning abstractly, but Hearst is the first real decision-making eyewitness. It sort of proves the worst, and it's unapologetic. Now I ask you, witness, is everything which I have read to you true to your own knowledge? It was. That concludes my cross-examination. Particularly, I think Goering was appalled by someone divulging information that he could have withheld. Once this was communicated, it had a massive impact. People were just simply shocked. They were shocked to believe that uh, these things could be done in a modern society. Hearst's emotionless admission becomes one of the most galvanizing moments of the trial. And in the summer of 1946, as the proceedings draw to a close, it is his words and the words of the survivors that resonate the loudest for prosecutors. My lord, I am deeply conscious that one of the greatest difficulties, and not the least of the dangers of this trial, is that those of us who have been engaged day in and day out for over nine months have reached the saturation point of horror. It is against such a background that these defendants now ask this tribunal to say that they are not guilty. If you were to say of these men, that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, that there are no slain, that there has been no crime. I now call defendant Herman William Gordy. Die Anklagebehörde hat die Verteidigung und ihre Beweisführung als völlig wertlos behandelt. Ich stehe zu dem, was ich getan habe. Despite everything, there was still an attitude amongst defendants of total self-righteousness and entitlement. War nicht imstande zu verhindern, was hätte verhindert werden müssen. But it is Rudolf Hess, who's not spoken since he admitted to faking amnesia, who delivers the most chilling of all final statements. Selbst wenn ich es könnte, wollte ich diese Zeit nicht auslöschen aus meinem Dasein. Ich bin glücklich zu wissen, dass ich meine Pflicht getan habe als treuer Gefolgsmann 
meines Führers. Hitler, Sieg! Ich bereue nichts. The tribunal will now adjourn in order to consider its judgment. This is Arthur Gay speaking from the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. After a month of deliberating, the Nuremberg Tribunal reconvenes to deliver verdicts and sentencing. Attention! Tribunal! The assembly is jam-packed. There must be 600 people in the courtroom. The newly transferred audio reveals the moment the sentences are read. Hello, son. Recording. Start cutting. Start cutting. Defendant Hermann Wilhelm Goering. The International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Hesch. The tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Julius Streicher, death by hanging. At the pinnacle of their power, they had seemed inconquerable. Wilhelm Keitel, death by hanging. Karl Dönitz, 10 years imprisonment. Albert Speer, 20 years imprisonment. But the Nuremberg trial reduced people who claim superhuman status. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, death by hanging. And they became no more than the victims that they had done to death. In the end, it's 18 guilty three not guilty. And so the Nuremberg prosecutors are generally quite satisfied. From a podium prosecutor to a clerk in a documents room, everybody who was a part of that was quite proud to be part of that. The tribunal will now adjourn. But not all of the condemned will face their court-appointed fate. Hermann Goering escaped his fate of hanging by committing suicide at 10.45 last night. Everyone was saying, how the hell does the major defendant end up taking a cyanide capsule. He did it so cleverly that the sentinel watching him did not even see him put his hand to his mouth. Goering's suicide sparks an extensive investigation, but it fails to uncover exactly how he got the poison. For him, it's a victory, isn't it? It was a massive humiliation for the Allies. With heightened security, the remaining executions are carried out just hours later. Only a handful of reporters are permitted to witness as the Nazis are hanged one by one on gallows built inside the Nuremberg prison. I was an eyewitness to the execution of the wilted flower of Nazidom. There was a silent, serious atmosphere.
Ten men had died here. And the body of the other was brought in to complete the picture. Justice has been done. The Nazis who are sentenced to jail are taken to Berlin's Spandau prison to serve their time. Hess is going to spend the rest of his life in prison in Germany. He had actually sat out a lot of the war in a British prison camp. And I think that's what saved him from the hangman's noose at the end of the trial. He will eventually hang himself in Spandau in the late 1980s. Dernitz has an interesting post-prison life. He was, I don't want to say celebrated, but he certainly wasn't hated in Germany. At the time of his passing, thousands of people flocked to his funeral. Boss. If there is a star of this trial, it's Albert Speer. Because when he comes out of prison, he writes his memoirs. The biggest selling set of memoirs around the world has ever been. In other words, he profits hugely. Of course, since then, history has discovered lots more specific knowledge of deportations, exterminations, all of that stuff that he distanced himself from, he was as bad as anybody who went to the gallows. The trial really did demonstrate to the world the crimes that the Nazi regime committed. And this notion that heads of state could be held criminally responsible, established a very powerful precedent for going forward. After Rwanda, after former Yugoslavia, the precedent set at Nuremberg is used again. That brought the International Criminal Court into being. So Nuremberg showed that when power and values unite, the world can do these kinds of rule of law projects. And that's a legacy that will challenge us ever more to live up to it. The sound recording, it's over.